Open with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. <clears throat> We'll begin, we will be ending the section that we've been in for some time now, for the last six or seven weeks. Mark chapter 4. This morning our text will be in 21 through 34. Before we actually read, allow me to give you a bit of context so you kind of know where we are. For the last few weeks, since chapter 3, verse 7, we've been in the section of Mark that deals with responses to Jesus, and and many of you are familiar with that. Mark has shown us a huge crowd. He said from Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon and Judea and Galilee, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of people following Jesus around. They're not necessarily following him, but they're following him around. And there are different reasons and different motivations for the people who are interested in Jesus. And and you've seen that. We've seen his disciples commit to him. We've seen people misunderstand him and try to control him. We've seen the scribes um, maliciously say that he's possessed by Satan. We've seen people who have just wanted something from him. And then you'll remember that last week, even though we're still in the same section and we're still dealing with the same topic, we've actually shifted gears. And it's not just Mark telling us stories about these different responses, it's actually Jesus who begins to tell parables to describe these different responses, right? He tells us that some hear and don't understand, or for some other reason, Satan comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Others hear, and and they accept, and they're happy for a little while, and then persecution comes, and and they're done. They're they're not in this if it's going to cost them anything. They, they, They don't want the life of discipleship if it's going to cost them something. He told us that other people hear the word, but the cares of the world are more important to them than the offer of forgiveness and the call to discipleship. And so that, that's where we've left off. But, but really, there's a question that we're going to answer this morning because Jesus is going to tell three more parables and he's gonna, Mark is going to finish this section about the parables. But, but consider with me what we heard last week and consider what questions might come to your mind, what might have come to the first disciples' minds, what might have come to Mark's first audience and their mind is this. Th- think about this. Jesus has just told us that most people will not repent. Most people will not bear fruit. He said that you, when you preach the gospel, when you share, you're up against Satan and persecution and the cares of the world. Not many people are going to follow for real. And that's what we've seen. Jesus has a handful of disciples. He's got the 12. He's probably got a couple hundred more people who actually believe in him. And you know from your experience that when you have shared the gospel or when you have told people about Christianity, most people don't care. And you've experienced the same thing. Satan comes and takes it away. The cares of the world are, are win out in the competition for their affection or persecution or the call to discipleship. It's, it's just not worth it for them. And so consider that truth. What question comes to your mind? You might ask something like, if most people aren't going to listen, if most people aren't going to bear fruit and repent, why would I even preach the gospel? Should I even share? Jesus, if you're telling me that there's just a select group of of people who are actually going to listen, should we actually go about uh, putting effort into sharing the gospel? Should we make this a a mission of ours? Should we actually do this? Or or should it be more of a passive pursuit? Should it be more of something that we tell our our close circle, our our inner friends? Something that we we don't really go out of our way to tell people about, but if they ask us, we'll tell them. Does that, does that make sense? Here's this question of most people aren't going to listen, so, so what should we do? Well, Jesus is going to tell three parables that answer that question. Jesus is going to tell uh, the parable of the lamp and the measure, and he says the truth's purpose is to be shared. A lamp is meant to illuminate things. A lamp is meant to be seen where everybody can see it. And then he's going to tell the parable of the, se- of the seed growing, which is about the process. It's about... Um, just because you share doesn't mean you're responsible for everything and you don't understand how, much, how, how the kingdom of God will grow and yet you're still responsible to share. And then he's going to tell the parable of the mustard seed which is uh, it, uh, the kingdom of God is going to start out with some humble beginnings but it's going to be an unbelievable outcome. And so read with me starting in chapter 4 verse 21 through 34. We'll finish Mark chapter 4 this morning. 
It says this in verse 21. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Verse 33. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. We have a lot to cover this morning, and I've already kind of summarized it for you. Allow me to repeat the outline to you so that you can uh, kind of see the packaging of where we're going. First of all is the parable of, of the lamp and the measure um, in verses 21 through 24, and that's really the purpose of the truth. The purpose is the key word. And then in verses 26 through 29 is the parable of the seed growing, and, and that's the process. So the purpose and the process. And then verses 30 through uh, 32 is the parable of the mustard seed, and that's the product. And so you have the purpose and the process and the product. I don't know if you know this, but many Baptist preachers are, are known for alliterating, using the same letters and the same sounds to, to form their outlines. Just so you know, I'm getting better at this Baptist preacher thing because I'm finally, after 20-some weeks, alliterated an outline. Purpose, process, and product. And then in the last couple of verses, we'll see that Mark ends that section. But first of all, look with me at the parable of the lamp and the measure in verses 21 through 25. We'll cover them separately, but it says this in verse 21. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will taken away. Allow me to paraphrase and kind of give you the point, and then we'll observe a couple of details and emphases. First of all, let me paraphrase this for you. Again, we ask the question, if most people won't believe, should we even really go out of our way to share the truth? And this parable is, indeed, yes, you should. A lamp is brought in to be seen. What I am doing is meant to be shared. So it's, it's, the, it's the entire purpose of why Jesus came. I mean, he came to redeem us, but then after that, the disciples, and included in that is me and you, we are to be sharing the work of redemption that Jesus has accomplished. Now, allow me to share a couple of details with you because there's something that the ESV misses out on a little bit. Uh, look at verse 21. He says this, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not a stand. That first phrase, is a lamp brought in. I'm gonna give you a little bit more of a literal, wooden, word-for-word -word translation of that so you can kind of see what the emphasis is. And so instead of saying, is a lamp brought in, the Greek actually says, does the lamp come in? You see, there's two differences there. Does the lamp come in? You see, if you say the lamp, is, a, a lamp is a lamp, versus the lamp, Jesus is saying that there's something specific and particular and special about this lamp. It's the lamp. Not only that, but he says the lamp isn't brought in. He says the lamp comes in. Maybe you don't use the ESV. Maybe your translation says, does the lamp come in? But doesn't that sound kind of awkward? What do you mean, the lamp? And what do you mean it comes in? Lamps don't come in by themselves. And, and what's so special about this lamp? Well, the awkward nature of that construction has led most people to believe that Jesus is referring to himself as the lamp. 
He is the lamp. He says that in John, somewhere, John chapter 9. I am the light of the world. It's also said in John chapter 1. He has come to illuminate. And that's why he doesn't say the lamp is brought in. He says the lamp comes in. And so it sounds awkward that a lamp is coming in by itself, but it probably refers to Jesus. Jesus is the lamp which comes in, and he's meant to be put on a stand. He's meant to be put somewhere where everybody can see him. Now, does that sound like a contradiction of anything that we've heard so far in Mark? And it should. It, it sounds kind of awkward because just last week we talked about the secret of the kingdom of God. Jesus said to you, to the disciples, to his inner circle, is given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables. And so Jesus last week told us that, that he doesn't want everybody to know the truth about the kingdom of God. We've also seen him rebuking demons for proclaiming his identity as the Son of God and, and as the Christ. And so how, how can he do that and then turn around and say that the lamp comes in to be put on a stand? Because the season that he's in right now in Mark's gospel of being concealed is a temporary season. That is not the permanent plan of God is to have Jesus come and accomplish redemption secretly. You see, we've already talked about why Jesus has kind of concealed his identity and his mission. And there's been different, there's been different reasons for that. He's done it to prevent people's misunderstanding, hasn't he? We've talked about that. If people understood that Jesus was the Christ, they might think that he's a military leader. He might inflame a, a, rebe a rebellion, a revolution, and bring the Romans in to kill millions of people, as they did just a couple of generations later. He's also done this. He's also hidden his mission and his identity, not just to prevent misunderstanding, but also to prevent understanding. We talked about that last week, didn't we? Jesus came and he began to proclaim parables so that he could veil the truth from his rejectors. Do you remember that? The mystery of the kingdom of God. But again, this is temporary. This is a temporary state of affairs. Jesus is only concealing his identity from the public for his own lifetime. We know that when he comes to his trial, they will say, please just tell us plainly, are you the Christ? And he says, yes, I am. And you will see me seated at the right hand of power with the angels and the winds and the clouds. He, he confesses his identity publicly later on. And so Jesus here is saying this whole concealing thing is, is temporary. We know that in the book of Acts, the disciples take the gospel and Jesus' mission all throughout the Roman Empire, don't they? They reach the entire known world. And we know that, that extrapolated out is us, the gospel has reached us, and we will cover that in the next parable. But Paul also talks about this. Paul talks about the mystery being revealed. He talks about it in Colossians chapter one or two. He talks about it in Ephesians. He says that when God saved us, he lavished on us all wisdom and insight and he made known to us the mystery of the kingdom of God. That God's plan for the fullness of time is to unite all things in Jesus, things in heaven and things on earth. So by the time Paul comes along, he says this mystery has been revealed. Jesus says here, the secrets, the mysteries of the kingdom of God are concealed. But again, this parable, a lamp is brought in to be put on a stand where everybody can see it. And so he's saying this to the disciples. Most people will reject, but you still need to share. You still need to preach the gospel. He's going to send his disciples out in chapter six on a mission trip throughout Israel. So he's saying this. Most people will reject, but the purpose of the truth and the purpose of my mission is to be shared. So don't be discouraged by the fact that most people will reject you. You are still responsible to share. Look at verses 22 and 23. He says this, For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. He says the whole reason that it's hidden is so that it may be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. It's hidden for now, it will be made manifest. It's secret for now, it will come to light. And again, he says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And that's him speaking to his disciples, those who are given the secrets of the kingdom of God. If you have ears, and we here have the spirit, and we have the word, we need to listen up. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So the question is, should we preach? Absolutely, even though most people re would reject. He continues on in verses 24 and 25 with this idea of, of a measure. He says this, and he said to them, 
Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Allow me to paraphrase. If you listen now to his disciples who are hearing this, if you listen now, you will receive more. Unlike those who refuse right now, they will, even what's being given to them right now in veiled and secrets, will be taken away. But for those of you who listen right now, you will receive more teaching, more will be given to you. You will be better equipped to share the gospel. He says this, For to the one who has, more will be given. That which you have right now, Jesus preaching to you and teaching you the kingdom of God, more will be given if you will listen with the measure you use. And he says this, From the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. For those who don't listen, what do they have right now? They have Jesus proclaiming secrets. They have Jesus proclaiming in a veiled way. Even that will be taken away because Jesus will be gone. Allow me to read a couple of commentaries for you because I thought they phrased this pretty well. Uh, The Net Bible Commentary says this, The one who accepts Jesus' teaching concerning his person and kingdom now will receive a share in the kingdom now and even more in the future. But for the one who rejects Jesus' words, the opportunity that that person presently possesses with respect to the kingdom will someday, someday be taken away forever. And so even though most people reject, Jesus is telling his disciples, you must listen and share anyway. And so that's the purpose. The entire purpose of the gospel is to be listened to, to be understood, and to be shared. Let's look at the next uh, parable in verses 26 through 29. This is a unique passage in Mark because most of what Mark writes is actually taken by Matthew and Luke. They copy what Matthew and Mark wrote and they kind of arrange it their own way. This is actually a parable that's only in Mark. Matthew and Luke didn't pick this one up. Read with me verses 26 through 29. He says this, He said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises, night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Allow me to give you the point and a paraphrase a little bit. Here's the point. You sow, but you don't grow. You are responsible to sow. You are not responsible to grow. Most people will reject. You are still responsible to tell them the truth. You don't understand what's going to happen to their heart when you proclaim the gospel to them. And the same was true of Jesus at this time. The disciples are going, why isn't the kingdom being built up? He says, because we're sowing and you don't understand what's gonna happen, but it's gonna happen apart from your understanding. The kingdom of God is going to grow apart from your understanding. I want you to, I want you to hone in on verse, uh, is it 27? It says, he sleeps and rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows. If you write in your Bible, underline this phrase, he knows not how. He knows not how. That's exactly what Mark is trying to point your, direct your attention to when he says that. He knows not how. That's the emphatic phrase in the whole parable. The reality is, you are responsible to sow and to spread the gospel, but there is an extent of your responsibility. You're not responsible to save people. Thank God, amen? Jesus saves people. You're not responsible to change people's hearts. The Spirit changes people's hearts. And so you are responsible to sow, but you don't know what God is going to do when you do sow it. And that was true of the disciples. They didn't understand how the kingdom was going to grow in the face of all this rejection. And that's true for us as we evangelize. And so look at verse 29. He says, when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Even though the sower doesn't understand, he's still able to reap a harvest. Even though you and I don't understand, there will be a harvest for those of us who diligently sow the word. And even though the disciples didn't understand what was going to happen to the kingdom, there was still going to be a harvest because of their diligence in sowing. And so that you, we are responsible to sow. We are not responsible to grow. That doesn't mean that we can't do anything else, right? Paul tells us in the book of Titus that we can behave in such a way that, that complements our gospel preaching. 
that our behavior can, can either shame or bring honor to the gospel. The gospel stands on its own, but we can kind of uh, package it with our behavior. A professor that I had in Bible college said this, a beautiful portrait needs a beautiful frame. You don't buy a frame from the dollar store to put a Rembrandt painting in. You, uh, you buy an expensive frame. You have something made. And so our behavior can uh, frame and buttress and support our proclamation of the gospel. But ultimately, we are responsible for sowing, not growing. And so know this. You need to sow. You need to wait. You need to trust and know that in your diligence, there will be fruit. There will be a harvest. And the same thing is true of the kingdom of God. These guys didn't understand how this was going to work out. And he's saying, you need to sow and wait and trust and know the extent of your responsibility. Let me read to you from William Lane. He says this, The period between sowing and harvest is not insignificant because something happens. <laughs> the seed must be allowed its appointed course as the process of growth and ripening advances toward a harvest that is approaching. So the seed must be allowed its course. You don't understand how it's going to work out, but in our diligence, it will. And knowing that that's the same thing that happened with the disciples. They had no idea how this was going to start. And apart from their understanding, it did. And so that's the process. We've seen the, pro the, the purpose of the truth, and we've seen the process of the kingdom. Now look with me at verses 30 through 32. This is, this is the product of the kingdom. It says in verse 30, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, and puts out large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. This parable, the point is the product of the kingdom. We've seen the purpose and the process, and now we see the product of the kingdom. And, and let me paraphrase it for you. The kingdom of God has humble beginnings and unbelievable results. Let me repeat that. The kingdom of God has humble beginnings and unbelievable results. He says in verse 31, it, it's like a mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Now let's pause right there and let's talk about a, an apologetic side note because this verse is the cause for some controversy. Some people like to come in and say, well, you know, Christian, uh, the mustard seed is not the smallest seed on the earth and Jesus supposedly was God and he supposedly knew everything, uh, but he thinks that the mustard seed was the smallest seed on earth and so your Jesus, your God, your Lord was wrong and your Bible is not without error. Now, you need to know that in Greek, the word for soil and ground and earth is the same word. Just like when we talk about the earth, we could be talking about the planet, or we can be talking about dirt, can't we? It has that same range. And so this phrase is actually, I think, best reflected in the New American Standard. I don't know if any of you use that, but in the New American Standard, it says when it's sown upon the soil, it's the smallest seed of all those upon the soil. And it's not, he's not saying that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds on the earth, because it's not. It's the smallest of all those seeds that would have been sown. And, he, and you can picture him saying, when it's sown on the soil, it's the smallest of all the seeds on the soil. Of course, they probably didn't sow things together, but you can picture it. There's soil there, there's different kinds of seeds. The mustard seed which have been, would have been the smallest one. And so I know that you believe that. I'm just kind of letting you know it. that's not a cause for controversy. There's nothing to worry about there. And so when he says it's the smallest of all the seeds on the earth, I think he's saying the smallest of all the seeds on the soil that would have been sown at that time. So he says, even though the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, which is little tiny, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants. Um, I, the research that I did, because I don't know about mustard plants as, many as, as much as probably most of you do, those can be 6 to 10 to 20 feet tall to 30 feet tall under ideal conditions, and they can have a 20-foot spread. Mustard bushes can be huge, even though their seeds are just little tiny. And so he's saying the mustard seed is, is very, <laughs> it's very deceptive. It's a very humble and small origin, and yet it grows up, and it's unbelievable. It's way bigger than all the other garden plants, which have bigger seeds. He says this, it even puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. The question is this, what do the birds of the air mean? 
Some of you have probably heard this debate. The birds of the air are different people, interpret them different ways. Uh, Some people believe that the birds of the air represent Satan and persecution. Because in the parable of the sower, he says that Satan is the birds that come and take away the word that is sown. And so some people say if, we're, if, we're being, um, if we have any continuity with the last parables, this is referring to Satan taking advantage of the church or, or persecuting the church. The church grows up and the birds come and persecute it. Other people say that this refers to a passage from Ezekiel chapter 17. God talks about planting a shrub, which is going to be like the kingdom of God, and and the birds of the air are going to come nest in this bush or this shrub or this tree, and that refers to the Gentiles coming in. That's that's what the passage of Ezekiel uh, chapter 17 says. To be honest with you, I don't really take it either way. Um, I think we need to be really careful with parables, especially since Jesus doesn't give us the interpretation of this parable. You'll remember, with the parable of the sower, he told us what that meant. With this parable, he doesn't tell us what it means, and so we need to be careful because we don't, we don't have 100% certainty the way that we do with the sower. I simply take the birds as, as a result. We've seen consistently through the parables uh, that the seed that falls on the good soil, it bears fruit, right? There's a result there. And the same thing with the last parable of the seed in the soil, um, it grows, and once the grain is ripe, there's a harvest, there's a result there. And so the same thing with this, I don't take it as being Satan persecuting or, or the birds or the Gentiles, I take it as just, it's, it's a result. It's something that's, that's small. There's some kind of fruit to be born there. And, you know, this is a really silly issue, so if you disagree with me about it, please don't leave the church. <laughs> you know, people like to leave churches over small stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so those are the birds. But again, here's the point. The result of the kingdom is, is much beyond what you would expect. It has humble origins and unbelievable products. Unbelievable products, unbelievable results. Now now consider this. Consider what has happened to the kingdom of God since the disciples. I I mean, consider where the kingdom of God started. The kingdom of God started with Jesus and John the Baptist proclaiming in Galilee of all places. You see, you have Israel and Judea. That's like the armpit of the Roman Empire. Everybody hated them. Everybody's like, you bunch of rebellious, old weirdos. You have one God. They considered them atheists because they only worshipped one God and they wouldn't adopt anybody else's gods. Nobody liked them. The Romans eventually ended up having to go in and, and destroy them because they were so stubborn. And so here you have this, this armpit of the empire and these backwoods within the armpit of the empire and that's where the gospel began. And yet again, we see throughout the book of Acts that the apostles spread the gospel throughout the whole Roman Empire. It reached Rome. It reached Caesar's ears. And eventually, the Roman Empire was converted to Christianity, albeit a a weird and kind of corrupt form of Christianity. But do you see the gospel ended up being accepted to some degree by everybody? I'm not saying everybody was Christians, but the disciples would have never imagined what happened throughout the Roman Empire if you were to tell them this at this point in Jesus' ministry. Think about this. It didn't just reach the ends of the Roman Empire. Fast forward 1,500 years, the gospel has reached places that they didn't even know existed. The gospel has reached all of the continents on the planet. They had no idea how far the gospel was going to go. It's in, it's in Middleton, Idaho. <laughs> hey, Peter, do you know the gospel is going to reach Middleton, Idaho? He, ha- he would have no clue what that means. And so the gospel, the kingdom of God, had humble origins and unbelievable results. And so again, we ask our question. Okay, Jesus, in that first parable, you told us most people were going to reject you told us that most people weren't going to listen to us. And so, so what's, what's the bother? Why would we put in effort? Why would we waste our energy and our breath trying to convert people if we know that most of them are going to reject? Well, he tells us in the three parables this morning, a lamp's purpose is to be seen. That's its very purpose. My mission is meant to be seen. I'm concealing myself for now, but you will proclaim my identity to the whole world. Not only that, not just the purpose, but the process is beyond your understanding. Even though you can't imagine how this is going to work out, I'm telling you, it will. Just like a sower doesn't understand all the details about how a seed grows, I'm telling you that in your diligence, the gospel will spread, and the process will be beyond your your understanding. 
Not only that, but the product. We have humble origins now. There's a handful of us right now. But know this, the kingdom is going to grow beyond what you can even imagine. It's going to be beyond your imagination and your wildest dreams. And so should we preach the gospel? We should be hearkening with amen. Yes, we should be preaching the gospel. Even though, still today, most people reject. We need to be diligent in sharing the gospel. Let me ask you this. Do you diligently share the gospel? Do you diligently share the gospel in spite of the fact that most of the people you're going to talk to will not listen to you? I can tell you this. I get my eyes on the responses of the people, and I get discouraged. And I think, that person's never going to become a Christian. That person's never going to repent. And you know what? From our point of view, it's impossible. But we're not just working with our point of view, are we? We're not just depending on our own proclamation of the gospel. We're depending on the sovereign God who saves people with his spirit and his word. And so we need to be diligent in preaching the gospel, knowing that the process is beyond our understanding and the product is beyond our wildest dreams and that a lamp's purpose is meant to be seen. Amen? Let's look at this last section, this last couple of verses, in verses 33 and 34. It says this, With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. So this is the end of the section of responses. This is the end of the parables. This is the end of Mark telling the different stories about people's different degrees of of belief and of doubt. And Jesus has, has shifted his teaching ministry to the public. Again, think about what Jesus did in the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke chapter four, how clear he was teaching the word. Think about the Sermon on the Mount, how clear Jesus was teaching. And now from this point, it says he would not speak to them without a parable. Because again, we talked about this last week, he's judging his rejectors, and he's also having mercy on them by not heaping more burden of responsibility on them for their knowledge of the word. Notice this, it says that he was telling them parables as they were able to hear it. He was explaining to the disciples different things about the kingdom of God as they were able to hear it. He's merciful towards us and patient with us, isn't he? We don't get it all at once, and so he shares those things with us as we're able to understand them. You see, if you don't understand different passages of Scripture or different theological concepts, you need to know that he's going to share them. You're going to learn them as you're able to hear it. You need to be patient with yourself in understanding and trust that God will give you that understanding. You also need to be patient with others as you evangelize and as you teach. You, You need to be sharing with people as they're able to hear it. People aren't going to get things all at once, and we know that I I myself know that I didn't get things all right at once. I still don't have everything down. Big surprise. Um, So you need to have that same patience that Jesus had with you and has with you. And notice he says he did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples. He explained everything. I pray that every one of us in here is a disciple who understands the things that he explained to us. I wonder how many of us in here are the ones who hear his words, but we're not actually disciples. I wonder how many of us here are those to whom the words of Jesus are veiled and calloused and not understandable. Is that you? Do you find yourself consistently going, I don't understand this. Perhaps, perhaps there's something with your heart. Perhaps there's something with you that you don't really know him. Have you repented? Have you experienced the change that he offers you? Have, has your old nature been crucified? Have you borne fruit? If you haven't, we would love to talk to you. We would love to, to share with you the gospel and the forgiveness that he offers. But I pray that us, that we in here are the disciples who hear, and it, who hear his explanations and who learn and who grow. I pray that none of us are those to whom the words of Christ are veiled and secret. And here's the good news again. The good news is this, that the gospel has come to Middleton, Idaho hasn't it? Or the gospel came to you wherever you were. You see, the the Bible tells us we were born in sin, that we were born his enemies, that we were born slaves in our sin and dead in our sin. And yet the gospel came to you, didn't it? And it freed you from your slavery and it brought your soul out of the grave, didn't it? 
Praise God that the gospel has reached us, even in Middleton, Idaho. But you need to be that same instrument that takes the gospel to those others who still haven't heard it in Middleton, Idaho, or wherever else you might live.